Unfortunately, we are the sad case that has just been referred to, the failure in gene therapy and an approval process at the CHMP. And my case study today is um, A, about the um, process, the regulatory process we went through with Glyvera, um, and secondly, what we're going to do with the company going forward, which continues to be a fascinating company with a leadership position in gene therapy for adeno-associated virus vectors. So my talk um, <coughs> will be very briefly on the general challenges of ultra orphan drug development. I will then focus on Glybera and the regulatory um, framework that we have encountered in getting this drug um, forward. And I will talk about the AMT strategy post Glybera. So obviously, the um, three major elements when you talk about challenges in orphan drug <coughs> are clinical trials, recruitment for those, um, they're obviously pricing and reimbursement for ultra often drugs. And someone said it this morning, um, with the number of patients getting smaller and smaller, the price has to go up. And therefore, you're in a space where you are not necessarily liked by the healthcare systems. And the third area is um, orphan drug regulation, which is what I focus on. I would think <coughs> that you still need innovation and have to accept that in ultra often disease development, um, you're in a situation where you have to adapt as you learn going through trials, and this is not yet appreciated by the regulatory. You also have to change your view on statistics. Those who want orphan drug treatment and ultra orphan drug treatment need to accept that there is a pricing that goes with it. And I think that the <coughs> position of the Committee for Advanced Therapeutics needs to be strengthened and there needs to be increased transparency in the regulatory process. I would like to mention that I'm focusing on Europe here. We have no experience with the FDA, and this is under the advanced therapeutics um, regulation of the EMA that I'm talking about. So, um, let me be specific about what I just said regarding clinical trials in small populations. And I'm, I'm citing, I'm quoting from the regulation. What the regulation for trials in small populations starts off with is with three sentences. In general, guidelines for large trials are applicable. Deviation from classical standards only if completely unavoidable, prospectively considered, and would need to be justified. Treatment effects should be ideally clinically relevant. Confidence intervals should be narrow, and the effect size statistically significant. Well, how does that tie with patient populations of about 1,000 patients? I think it's important. This is in the, in the um, preamble of the small population regulation. And, and what it tells you is that when you come with trials that are from small population, you're already in the wrong camp, and you have to defend yourself for what you're doing. The mindset is not set on small populations um, as the regulation should be for. So let's now look at Glybera in its um, regulatory framework. What is Glybera? It is a gene therapy, AAV-based, for lipoprotein lipase deficiency, the inability of um, handling chylomicrons, which are the carrier molecules for <coughs> after a fatty meal. And the um, most important manifestation is pancreatitis, which often is lethal. Many of our patients um, develop 50 um, pancreatitis in their life. And those who know how painful they are know what these patients go through. The only medication today is a fat-free diet, which is literally impossible. Chylomicronemia, diabetes, atherosclerosis, all these things that people encounter who are obese is what these people also encounter earlier than others and um, with severe consequences. Now, we have applied under exceptional circumstances. And it's interesting to read this. I'm, I'm giving you text from the regulation again. It's the guideline on procedures for the granting of MA under um, exceptional circumstances. And what it says is then when the applicant can show that he is unable to provide compre comprehensive data on the efficacy and safety under normal conditions of use, because the indications for which the product in question is intended are encountered so rarely that the applicant cannot reasonably be expected to provide comprehensive evidence, um, then a marketing authorization may be granted subject to certain specific obligations. Uh, so clear, if you don't have enough patients, then the regulation says under exceptional circumstances you should be approved and then provide the evidence later on. 
Now, in this context, we have um, gone through a process, and first of all, we failed in June and had a clear majority of um, the whole process against us. But we had a recommendation from the chairman of the CAT and from the head of the MHRA to go forward into an appeal process, and that we did. And the result of this process, which um, brought us into the zone where money was getting tight in the company, we had um, basically two rapporteurs supporting the approval um, process and saying should be approved. We had the CAT who said we have a few questions, so they gathered a scientific advisory group of 10 scientists from all over Europe to spend a full day evaluating our data, listening to us, and um, they recommended at the end of the day that the drug should be approved under exceptional circumstances. This went to the CAT, and in the CAT, two-thirds, the Committee of Advanced Therapeutics, two-thirds of the members voted for approval. So the question is, why then does the CHMP vote against approval? And um, with a test vote of 16 to 15, which was the vote that led them to tell us that we had failed. The consequences are pretty um, drastic. We had to suspend Glabira development, um, current ongoing clinical trial, and our Duchenne muscular dystrophy product because that's the cash um, absorption is the highest with that program. Patients in Europe will not be treated with Glabira, which is, I think, um, terrible because that would not have been necessary. We have a headcount reduction by about 45 people, 245 from 90. Recapitalization of the company at a market cap of 7 million euro is not something that's being done easily. And I think the worst, and this concerns us all far beyond Glavira, is the fact that there is complete unclarity about the regulatory situation, which will further slow down investment in the gene therapy space, as people have told us, and has led partners um, not to continue their partnering discussions. I will give you some more of this text very quickly. I have the question, which is, um, does the CHMP actually have the right to do this? If there is a process um, that is escalating through three um, different groups of scientific um, competent um, bodies, do they have the right to actually come with their decision? And yes, they can. Following the, um, the regulation, CHMP shall be responsible for drawing up the opinion of the agency on any matter concerning an authorization to place a medicinal product for human use on the market? So the answer is yes. Here we go. They have the right to do it. The next question, what then is the role of the Committee of Advanced Therapeutics in getting drugs to market? And here, um, it's very clear again, preparing a draft opinion on the quality, safety, and efficacy of each advanced therapy medicinal product for final approval by the agencies, CHMP. So fine, they prepare the draft opinion for approval um, for, um, as it's, they prepare it, um, for the CHMP basically to give a final approval. Clear, they prepare the opinion for final approval by the CHMP. Now, is the CAT qualified to do that? Well, you read again the text in the regulation, and it says that the CAT should gather the best available expertise. It's not in the CHMP, it's here. And it says the composition of the CAT should ensure appropriate coverage of the scientific areas relevant to advanced therapies, including gene therapy. So, the answer to my question is yes, they're better than anybody else, you should think. Well, and then, why then does the CHMP ignore the scientific advice from the CAT and the scientific advisory group and the rapporteurs, is the question that you would probably ask. If you, if you read point four, um, it is very clear that they have the right to do it, and if they have a different opinion for whatever reasons, they can say that, they can vote against it, they just have to argue scientifically, which is what they did. And um, the funny thing is that basically the scientific argumentation they're bringing forward is very judgmental. It doesn't bring new scientific evidence against us. Um, it's, it's a different judgment call. And don't ask me why it happened, I'm not sure, but clearly this regulation states that it has the authority to do it if it explains. Now, look at Glibera, at the case study. Um, it is an ultra rare disease, one to two in a million, um, which is a tiny population. We think about a thousand patients worldwide can be treated with Glibera. 
So it's not a big risk and it wouldn't be a big proliferation of drug product. The conventional clinical development faces extreme challenges here. Um, just two numbers are important. To do a controlled trial, what they expect you to do in principle, and they have repeated it many times, you need 342 patients. And we believe that the population in Europe is 250 patients. So a controlled trial just doesn't work. We have looked at 27 pages, patients, and the major argument was not sufficient um, to prove clinical evidence. One other important aspect, I just skipped over it, is that in, in a disease like this, there's very little information and you learn as you go. So your clinical trial is um, often changing in endpoints, as we have heard earlier in presentations during the day as well. Now let's look at this clinical benefit. The nice thing is that the EMA has accepted a biomarker um, as evidence for um, the proof for clinical benefit. And here, very quickly, we're looking at chylomicron handling. Chylomicrons, the carrier molecules that lead to eventually the pancreatitis in the body. And we're looking at, does the gene therapy actually have an effect on, um, on, on enhancing chylomicron clearance and hence should have an effect on, um, in, in terms of having less pancreatitis events. If you look at this curve here, this shows chylomicron concentration. This shows the curve of the same population as this pretreatment, and you see the concentration goes very high up, and then over 24 hours hardly comes down. So too much fat in the body, too much chylomicrons in the body. 14 weeks after treatment, the same patients um, showed this curve, which is very close to a um, healthy um, person, and a week after treatment, it's here. Unfortunately, we did this in our third clinical trial. We only had five patients, therefore this data is only for five patients um, here, for five patients here, and only for three patients here, which is not a big number. I have to admit that, but it is a very clear signal, actually, that something's going on that should be helpful. The EMA also concluded, looking at the data, that the gene therapy platform that we're using um, can be validated. They have not found um, safety issues that they would consider showstoppers in the, in the context of gene therapy. And most important, they have not identified any risks that are specifically linked to gene therapy. We're very proud of that because it, it does away with a lot of issues that we've had to deal with in the past, which was a general feeling about risks in um, gene therapy. So they concluded also in writing that carcinogenicity, one of the major obstacles for gene therapy, was a risk that they viewed marginal, and the potential risks identified were administration procedure and the use of immunosuppressions, and all you all know that this is not specific to gene therapy, but something um, very general. So the conclusion um, was in the first round um, that the applicant had not provided sufficient evidence of a persistence of effect in lowering blood fats in a clinically relevant manner, and there were too few patients for whom sufficiently long-term data were available. There was also insufficient evidence of a reduction in the rate of pancreatitis. The final assessment in the re-examination process, the CAT concluded that these concerns could be addressed with additional post-marketing studies. The CHMP, interestingly, still considers Glybera to be potentially valuable, whatever this means, concluded that the benefits of the medicine did not outweigh its risks due to questions <coughs> of the medicine's benefits. Now, while scientifically you can take that position, um, I think the issue is you could also have taken a different position. And that's the issue I have with this. I think it is short-sighted and it is putting a break to the development of great medicines in the gene therapy at, um, space at this point which would not have been necessary. And by the way, this was the opinion of 16 from 13 in the test vote, which was then rather, um, later changed to 18 to 12 on the final day. But this <coughs> is roughly reflecting half of them viewing that the CHMP has taken the right decision and the other half saying, well, they would have seen it approved under exceptional circumstances. Now, what do we learn from this? Um, I think we need to use scientific advice as much as we can and as early as we can. But the most important point from my perspective is we have done that. We have to force them to commit to something and to say what they really want for giving you approval. And you don't get that commitment when you talk to them. They give you very general answers. Yes, you could do this. This looks interesting. It might. And it's this kind of thing. Um, they are not specific. And I think forcing them to commit, in particular in writing, is really important. Also, I think we have to teach them 
um, in understanding advanced therapies like gene therapy because the knowledge in the CHMP naturally is not extremely broad for these additional um, uh, therapies. That is actually why they implemented the CAT. So why then not listen to it? But if we want to get over that hump, we need to teach them, we have to be close to them, and we, we shouldn't assume that they know everything about this. And we all need to lobby, and I think the, the assumption that I showed earlier on, that, um, that you're looking basically at control trials like if you are in a, in a big disease, should be changed, and you should say that if you see efficacy in one patient, then test how many patients you can find where it works, rather than the other way around. These are my, um, my, my um, points that I'm taking away from this process, which was very painful. Let me um, quickly summarize um, AMT's way forward. Um, he's looking at the watch. I will not spend ages of time here. Just mentioned the company now focuses on one vector system for which we have an exclusive um, position, AV5. We're focusing on CNS diseases and liver diseases. And the great um, differentiation to other companies in our space is that we have a proprietary large-scale GMP manufacturing capability uh, based on insect cells, which gives us a great differentiation and allows us to get academia um, to um, work with us when they are looking at a perspective of taking drugs to market, because then you need manufacturing, and this is one of the key bottlenecks in the past. Here is our pipeline. I will skip this. There are four programs that we're currently concentrating on, and we're doing it in partnerships, and we're trying to um, have a minimal cash um, in, in involved in our programs by partnering with academia. So oftentimes now you find in academia great programs that are being taken to proof of concept where we then can take them on and bring them forward. And these are the, um, the institutes that we're working with. Um, let me quickly go through the individual diseases that we're looking at here. The first one is a cooperation with the University in Pamplona on porphyria. Um, this is a um, monogenic disease. We have full commercial rights. It is funded by um, the university there, and we have an EU, um, um, EU grant on it so that this comes practically um, cash neutral to us. It's going to be in a phase one study next year. The next one, which is highly interesting, is glial-cell-derived neurotrophic factor. It has a broad application in the CNS. We have licensed the rights for gene therapy of GDNF, the gene from Amgen, and we're collaborating with UCSF in Parkinson's with the University of Toulouse and University of Cambridge in trying to find proof of concept in animals for Huntington's and for MSA. We have a collaboration with the Institut Pasteur in, in Paris on a lysosomal storage disease which is complementary to the one that we've just heard about before, which was San Filippo A, how is the San Filippo B? And here the AFM, and we've heard the discussion earlier of the AFM, is funding this, so it comes cash neutral to us. In a way, we're actually being paid for our vector manufacturing, and we have an option to take this on if proof of concept is positive. We have a fantastic program in hemophilia B, and this is with um, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in the US and, and the University College in London. And I would like just to share data of six patients that have been tested in this trial. The first one um, was actually two years ago. That's this one here. Um, not two years, it's 20 months. Um, it's a non-therapeutic dose in animals. And if you look at the result, there is a stable expression over two years of 2% of normal which leads to no longer having to take any prophylaxis at all. And this is fantastic because you only need 2% to no longer take um, protein from the outside. Six patients dosed, four of which are completely off prophylaxis, two have a significantly reduced um, um, frequency of prophylaxis, and, um, and this means that <coughs> there is a long um, sustained, sustained effect in this um, major disease. And beyond that, we have a superior um, capability in terms of manufacturing, but also the broadest capability in taking programs in gene therapy all the way through the regulatory process to almost approval. Our financial strategy will be heavily dependent in the future on partnerships and um, venture capital. Thank you very much. Thank you.